Hey you guys, Flickers of Fear time. The movie I'm talking about today is kind of like, I feel like this is really a something of a forgotten gem. And it's a, I really don't know why a lot of people don't talk about this movie. And the crazy thing too is that, which I didn't actually find out until I went uh, researching a little bit more about it, was that this movie had a VHS release for sure back in the late 80s, but it never got a DVD release and it only got a Blu-ray release in 2016, even though this movie came out in 1988, which is crazy to me because this is actually a really, really good movie. Now, what ended up happening with this uh, film, like how I ended up talking about it this week, it's called Jack's Back, by the way, uh, starring James Spader. Now, I actually saw this movie probably back in 1990 or 1991. I'm pretty sure I rented it from like our mom and pop video store, or it's possible I could have seen it on cable, but I'm pretty sure that I saw the VHS cover. I'm pretty sure that I rented it because I like James Spader and uh, you know, it's touted as something being sort of like Jack the Ripper. So I was like, oh, two things that I like very much. How can that go wrong? And indeed it didn't, it was a very good movie. So, uh, so I saw it a couple times back then. I think I maybe, you know, when I rented it, like back in the old days, I had the dual deck VCRs and before they had all that macro shit, like where you couldn't record shit. Um, I used to rent stuff from the video store and then, you know, if I liked it, I would make a copy for my own self. And I'm pretty sure that I did that with this one too. So I saw it like several times in the late eighties and, or, or rather the early nineties. And then I kind of like forgot about it. Now, probably about a year ago, I was flipping through flipping through, scrolling through. <laughs> so you can tell I'm old because I still talk about things as though they're like physical medium. So I was scrolling through Tubi and I noticed that they had Jack's back on there and I was like, oh shit, I remember that movie. Uh, maybe I should like, uh, you know, watch that and review it. So I wrote it on my absurdly long list and I said, okay, well, I'll get around to it eventually. And then a few months ago, uh, I actually started watching it, but then I got like distracted and then I ended up doing another movie that week. So I didn't do it. But then just like last week or the week before I got a message from a listener and was like, oh, you should totally do Jack's back. And I'm like, funny, you should mention that. Uh, I'd actually been wanting to do that for about a year. And I said, might as well do it right now because it's still on Tubi. Who knows? It's been on there for a while. So I don't know how much longer it's going to be on there. But yeah, this is actually like a really, really good movie. And I just feel like it's really kind of sadly underrated. I think maybe the problem too, because when this came out, um, I don't think it was like hugely expensive to make, but I think it only made like half of its budget back and it didn't even really get that good of reviews. Although Siskel and Ebert liked it. So they both thought it was great, which it is. I think part of the problem, I don't think the problem was that it was a bad movie. I think the problem was that it was a little bit mismarketed. So as I said, the movie's about Jack, ba Jack uh, is called Jack's Back, and the trailer for it made it seem as though this was like a slasher or like a serial killer movie, like about, it almost kind of implied that James Spader was going to be playing someone who was like reincarnated Jack the Ripper, who was like a killer and stuff. I kind of feel like that was the vibe that a lot of the marketing and the trailer and stuff put off. And that's absolutely not what this movie is. Yes, there is a killer in it that's, you know, like a copycat Jack the Ripper killer, and that is going on, but it's almost kind of like a background. This is actually more like a Hitchcockian crime thriller with a little sprinkling of maybe paranormal, you know what I mean? So uh, if you haven't seen it, I would recommend that you go to Tubi and watch it because while I might not, well, I probably won't spoil the ending, like who the killer is and stuff like that. It's really hard to talk about this movie because it has like a lot of twists and turns. It's really hard to talk about this movie past like the 20 minute mark um, without spoiling some shit. That's, you know, uh, several of the twists and turns that it takes. So it's really, so I'm going to have to spoil some things because otherwise I would have to stop talking like right now about it. And I don't really want to do that. And like I said, I don't know. I'm I'm kind of of two minds about spoiling things because this movie, it's old. I mean, it came out in 1988, but I do kind of feel like maybe a lot of people haven't seen it. And this is a movie that because it's a crime thriller, because it's twisty turny, it's probably better to go into it not knowing any of the twists and turns, like not knowing any of the plot points, because I don't think it'll ruin it because it's still like a good movie anyway, like the acting and stuff. But it is better like not really knowing where it's going because there's a lot of like surprises in it. So, uh, so as I said, this is a marginally 
uh, a Jack the Ripper, or rather like a Jack the Ripper copycat type story, but that's very much like in the background. So what you have, oh, and I should say too that Jack's Back was not actually the original title of this. It was actually supposed to be called Red Rain, uh, named after the Peter Gabriel song, because they actually wanted the Peter Gabriel song to be like the theme. But I guess they, you know, this was a lower budget production and they couldn't afford to get the rights to that song. So they decided they were just going to change it to Jack's Back. And like I said, market it more like a slasher or a horror movie, like about a serial killer, which it's really not. I forgot to mention, too, that this was actually the directorial debut of Rowdy Harrington. Now, if you know that name, he's probably best known for Roadhouse. Now, (laughs) I love Roadhouse, but don't think that this movie is anything like Roadhouse. It's really not, because Roadhouse is just, like, so cheesy and ridiculous and fun. This one is much more, like I said, much more Hitchcockian, like a dark, brooding almost noirish uh kind of thing so it really doesn't have hardly anything in common with roadhouse i think that he made uh he also made striking distance i've seen some other reviews of this that said that this was james spader's first starring role i don't think that's the case i think he'd actually had a starring role in a movie back in 85 and of course he was in a lot of um you know he was in pretty in pink and all that kind of stuff. So I had seen him in a bunch of shit, like prior to him seeing this, which is why I wanted to see this movie. Cause I was like, Oh, James Spader. I love that guy. And I also like, because I kind of feel like particularly because of pretty in pink and less than zero. And like a lot of the stuff that he was in, in the mid eighties, he kind of got typecast as like arrogant yuppie douche. Um, which he's very good at playing that. I'm not saying that, but he didn't get a lot of roles like outside of that. But if you want to see him, do something completely different and play against type and actually play dual roles in this, um, then definitely check this one out because he's actually a great actor when he's not typecast into that role. Like I said, he was, he played a good arrogant yuppie douche. I'm not saying that, but it was interesting to see him play pretty much a completely different kind of character. I think one of the characters he plays in this actually kind of reminds me more of like the character he played from Stargate. So, you know, kind of that type of dude. But like I said, he plays uh, dual roles in this. He plays twin brothers. So, all right. So here we go with this plot. And like I said, it's very twisty turny. I'm not going to spoil everything. Like I probably won't spoil like the end who the killer is and stuff, but I'm going to have to spoil some plot beats, you know, just in order to discuss the movie. So when we first start out, as I said, in the background, so it's 1988. So it's actually the hundredth anniversary of the Jack the Ripper murders. And in Los Angeles, some serial killer has got it into his head that he's going to perfectly recreate all of the original Jack the Ripper murders, like on the same date that it happened. He's going to do the same mutilations and he's going to do all that. So he's been doing that and the cops uh, are not able to catch him. So that's kind of going on, you know, in the background. James Spader uh, plays a guy named John Westford. Now he's a med student. I don't think he's finished medical school yet but he's still doing residency or whatever the hell. And he, uh, I guess he grew up like in kind of a poor neighborhood and he's a very, um, he's a very good person. He's very humanitarian. He's very, uh, cares about the poor. And so he actually works in a free clinic, like in the, uh, you know, very financially strapped neighborhood where he grew up because he wants to give back to the community. He's also very, um, He's an advocate for the homeless and stuff. Kind of they show him uh, talking to all these people like in the, you know, the hobo camps or whatever the hell you want to call them, uh, you know, tent cities and like trying to advocate for their care and things like that. And he goes and takes care of them for free. So like I said, he's he seems like just a really good dude. I mean, there's like nothing, you know, negative about him at all. He's just a really sweet guy who cares about other human beings. So he works at this clinic with this other young woman named uh, Chris. I think her character name is. Now, she's played by Cynthia Gibb. She was in a bunch of stuff. She was in that, uh, what was that Burt Reynolds movie that we talked about the other day, the matinee one? She was actually really, really young. And it wasn't Gator. It was, uh, now I can't remember what it was. But but yeah, so she was uh, in that as well. So she's kind of like, uh, you know, friends with him. And he's got some other friends at at the clinic and everything like that. Now, the guy that runs the clinic is shitbag. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, Dr. Sydney, that's his name. So, uh, so yeah, so he's the guy that runs the clinic, 
and he just does not have any patience for any of this like humanitarian like you know fuck the poor all that kind of stuff and he also has like a real like moral kind of streak where like this woman comes in and she's pregnant and i guess she wants an abortion or something like that and he's like you should think about your life choices and blah, 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 blah. so you know he's excoriating her and um so so there's that and james spader is just kind of like uh, all right whatever so uh so basically what happens is that he's worried about uh the pregnant woman and he knows her i think he knows her because there's a picture of what looks like him and her like in a picture together but you find out later like i said that he has a twin brother so i'm thinking that maybe because she comes out of the office after getting yelled at for wanting an abortion and she looks at james spader like holy shit i know you and she's like oh and he's like holy shit i know you but they don't i think the implication is that that was maybe i don't think it was his ex-wife i think it was his ex like sister-in-law or something i could be totally wrong about that but she either knows him or she knows his twin brother so he's kind of like worried about her so he finds out where she lives and he, she's he's gonna go like check on her and uh it so happens that the the jack the ripper serial killer that's been going around he's gotten to the last uh you know the last kill which is you know the most gruesome one the girl that was killed inside of her room and that girl was actually uh a month pregnant or something like that i can't remember like in real life was she actually a month pregnant or did, did they actually not i don't know was that something that they thought in the 80s and that's not i don't remember but anyway in the movie they say yeah, the, the girl was uh, a mother pregnant. So we know he's going to kill a person like that. We just don't know who it is. And we know when the date's coming up, because like I said, all the dates matched up with the original Jack the Ripper murders. So he goes to check on this patient. And when he gets there, uh, he discovers that she has been, she's the murder victim. She was like horribly, horribly mutilated. Now, while he's there, he runs into this guy who's like a, I guess he's like an orderly, like at the clinic that he works at. And he and he's like, what the fuck are you? Did you just like, so you're Jack the Ripper? And he's like, no, no, I just came to give her an abortion, like on the down low. And, you know, then I saw you and I ran away. And he's like, yeah, likely story. But it was like this big chase. And uh, upshot of it is about half an hour into a movie, into the movie, uh, the original James Spader, whose character's name is John, the nice doctor guy, he gets into a fight with this orderly who is maybe jack the ripper uh so they get into a fight and john the james spader nice guy he gets killed like but in a way that looks like and as he makes it looks like look like he hung himself and then he sort of like does a little bit of a frame up sort of shit um so it looks like you know this humanitarian doctor was actually jack the ripper and then he was done like you know with the series and so he hanged himself so the cops are like woohoo you know well one more girl got killed but oh well case closed you know what i mean so the weird thing about this i had forgotten like i remembered sort of like the jack the ripper aspect and i remember james spader being it but i didn't remember like all the twists and turns of the plot so when i'm watching it again like half an hour in james spader gets killed and i'm just like wait he can't be, is he dead or is it they killed james spader like half is this psycho what the fuck's going on so there was that but then it's like so he hangs and he and he's dead and i'm like okay there he can't be alive because i kept thinking that he was gonna like pop back and like be alive and but he wasn't so then they cut to James Spader, like, waking up in bed, like, he's having a nightmare, like, holy shit. So for a second, you think, oh, the first, like, half an hour or that whole sequence of him, like, chasing the maybe Jack the Ripper and, like, getting hanged, that you thought that that was, like, a dream. But no, it turns out that this James Spader is John's twin brother, Rick, Ricky, Richard. They call him, like, different things. So this is the twin brother. Now, like I said, this doesn't come out of thin air um i had forgotten this but they do actually set it up like at you know at the very beginning like john's having a conversation with this old lady that's come into the clinic and and she asks him about his family he says oh i've got a brother but i don't really talk to him or anything like that and they do actually show him in his apartment and there's like pictures of two little boys that are clearly twins so it's not like they just like completely like woo there's a twin they did like set it up it's just if you didn't know that ahead of time it wouldn't like register necessarily so i, th I thought that was like a really good touch like really good writing because then you go back and you're like oh yeah he did mention that he had a brother that he didn't talk to so the twin brother 
has apparently had, you know, because twins supposedly have that kind of like psychic connection type shit. They don't say psychic really in the movie, but, you know, this character, Rick, you know, he looks exactly the same, obviously, because it's still James Spader, but he's a little bit of a different, he's not a bad guy. He's still a good dude, but he's a little more, you know, he's a little more of a bad boy type. Like he's made some questionable choices in his life. Um, you know, he's a little edgier. He's a little angrier. Um, he's kind of a little bit more like scrappy in the sense of like, and he hangs out like it with a lot more, you know, sort in like sort of seedy uh, type of areas and it's maybe implied that uh, he's not always exactly on the right side of the law like he's not a murderer or anything but just kind of like minor shit wears a leather jacket and stuff like that now I will say that James Spader like doing the dual roles in this is so good and it's not kind of like because you know how sometimes you see movies with an actor like playing twins and they'll try to you know, really, really differentiate between the two characters and they'll kind of go too far with it. This is not like that. You can absolutely tell these are two different characters, but he plays it. It's pretty low key. It's just in a lot of things, like just kind of the way he, his facial expressions, the way he moves his body, um, stuff like that. But it's just really, you know, just even that, the stare that he has, like he's a lot more intense as as Rick. So it's a great performance. I mean, I think it's pretty much, you know, right up there with Jeremy Irons and Dead Ringers where, you know, they, it's, it's just like a really subtle thing, but you can absolutely tell they're two completely different people. And I think he like, he did a really good uh, job. And that's what I'm saying. You know, it's kind of a shame that in the eighties he got typecast. James Bader got typecast into these, you know, type of arrogant yuppie douche roles because, you know, when he was in this, he was actually like really, really good. This is one of his best films, I think. So Rick has a, what he presumes is a vision or a dream of his brother's death. Now, he's like, he tells the police, he's like, you know, you're going to think this is really stupid, but he's like, I, I saw it in a dream. And they ask him, they obviously don't really buy it, but they're like, okay, well, obviously you're his twin brother because you look just like him. And they're like, well, has weird shit like this happened to you before? And he's like, not really. He's like, one time when we were kids, like we... Uh, we were in this class and we took the test and our tests were exactly the same, like all the mistakes and everything. And so the teacher thought we had cheated off each other. So um, made us take the test over again, like in separate rooms and the same thing happened. So obviously they had some kind of connection, but he's like, that's really the only weird thing that's happened. He's like, nothing like this has happened to me before. Um, but he's like, I'm telling you right now that my brother was absolutely not the Jack the Ripper killer and someone murdered him and made it look like suicide. And I saw the person in my vision and I'm going to find out, I'm going to get to the bottom of it. So the cops, like I said, they don't really believe him. Um, they kind of do, but then they're just kind of like, well, I don't know. This sounds really bullshitty. And there's like, well, maybe you're the killer and you killed your brother and you're trying to like do this whole frame up. So they start following him around as well because they think he's like pretty sus. So, uh, so he kind of en enlists the help of Chris, the young woman at the, uh, the clinic who was friends with the brother. She believes him. And so they kind of do a little bit of sleuthing like on their own to try to figure out like uh, who the killer is so he can clear his brother's name because, you know, like I said, the cops are operating under the assumption that his brother was the killer or that he's the killer and he killed his brother. But like I said, he knows he saw the dude's face. He saw the dude that killed um, the, the clinic orderly that killed his brother. Now, you don't know if that guy was actually the Ripper or if he really did go to that girl's apartment to give her an abortion and then, you know, John turned up and, you know, he freaked out and then they had a fight and he's like, okay, well, I'm just gonna kill you. So, but he's like, well, I for sure saw that guy. And he sees like a picture like in his brother's apartment of, you know, the clinic staff. And he's like, that's the guy. That's the guy that was in my you know, that was in my uh, vision. So they kind of look into that as well. But like I said, there's lots of like twists and turns 
after that. But it's just, it's so great. Like I said, it's like a psycho moment because you're only like 20, 30 minutes into the movie and the main character you've been following this whole time, he's suddenly dead, you know what I mean? And I'm sitting there going, what? You can't... You can't put James Spader on the fucking cover and, like, then just kill him off, like, half an hour to the movie. What the fuck are you doing? And uh, so I was like, well, he can't be really dead. And then I'm like, oh, I guess he is really dead because he was, man, he was just fucking hanging there. But then, yeah, so then they bring in the twin brother element, which I had completely forgotten about. Um, you know, I'd forgotten that plot point, like, entirely. Uh, but, yeah, so... If you have not seen it, if you really like James Spader, if you really like, like I said, it's not a horror movie. It's got some serial killer stuff. It's got like some gore, like um, when he finds the, you know, the uh, the pregnant lady that's been killed. Um, it's kind of gory and yucky. Like it's kind of, it's not as bad as the real, if you've ever seen the real uh, crime scene photos, <laughs> like the Jack the Ripper, the last victim where she was just like completely butchered and evis eviscerated and there was just like intestines everywhere and shit like that it's not that bad but it's kind of gory but it's not it's not really a horror movie i would call it it's more like a noirish like crime thriller with like a serial killer horror kind of aspect to it but it's really really good like this it's very suspenseful it's shot really nice like i really like like i said it's very kind of smoky and noirish and it's got that um kind of saxophone like late 80s kind of almost like the erotic thrillers that would come out like in the 90s like after basic instinct and all that it's got that kind of vibe to it but yeah it's really really good and i just wish that it was better known um, I wish that they had maybe marketed it better back in the old days. I do kind of feel like even the cover art on the box, the cover art's basically just like a picture of James Spader, like looking kind of like that. And then it's, just, you know, the title Jack's back and that's it. You don't really, you can't really tell like what kind of, but like I said, it's almost implying, oh, James Spader is Jack the Ripper. Like he's reincarnated as Jack the Ripper. Or he's a serial killer or something like that. And that's not really how it goes. I think maybe... Uh, you know, Jack's Back is a good, punchy title, but I think that it was kind of misleading in the sense that it made people think that the movie was going to be about a Jack the Ripper killer, and it's not exactly that. That's just kind of going on in the background and is sort of like the jumping off point for this whole thing where this dude's trying to like clear his brother's name because his brother gets accused of being this killer. So it's mostly about him and about like the investigation and, you know, this kind of twisty turny like murder mystery. So it's not so much about the serial killings. It's not a slasher. It's not anything like that. I kind of feel like maybe they should have called it Red Rain like they wanted to. Like even like I love that song. And it would have been awesome if they could have got that song. They actually, they wanted that song. They couldn't afford it. So they had like a songwriter write a song kind of like it that's called Red Harvest, which is a perfectly good song. But I do kind of wish that even if they hadn't been able to get the rights to the Peter Gabriel song, maybe they should have called it Red Rain. I don't know. But then there was that other, there was that movie called Black Rain that was uh, Ridley Scott. Was that Ridley Scott or Tony Scott? I think it was Ridley Scott. And uh, when did that come out? Be a year before this? year after this? Now I can't remember. But yeah, so maybe they were like, oh, it's like too similar. But I think that if they had given it a title that didn't have Jack in it, then maybe it would have done better because people would have just seen it as, you know, like a crime thriller instead of expecting it to be about Jack the Ripper. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, but yeah, it's, it's really kind of a shame because this is actually a really, really good movie. One of the best crime thrillers from this era, from that year. And it just seems like a lot of people don't talk about it. Like I said, it never even got a DVD release, like not in the United States. And as far as I could determine, uh, you know, it only just got a Blu-ray release in... 2016. I think it's got some extras on it, but not a great deal from what I could uh, determine. I think they're, they had Rowdy Harrington, and I think he did a commentary track, but I think it's just him. I don't think they have James Spader on there. But yeah, so it doesn't have a lot of extras. Like I said, it just seemed like it came out. It didn't do all that well. Like, it didn't make any money. And then it just sort of went to VHS. A couple people like me picked it up, because like I said, hey, James Spader. Um... And then it just kind of got forgotten about, like, for years and years. So hopefully now that it's out on Blu-ray, um, it'll get rediscovered. Like I said, it's on Tubi as of this recording, uh, and I definitely do recommend it. It's actually, like, a really good, really suspenseful thriller. And, you know, if you're into James Spader and you want to see something 
him being uh, a character that he didn't usually play, like in the 80s, like playing a little bit against type, then uh, this is absolutely worth watching. Let me know if you've seen it, if you saw it back in the old days like I did, and then just kind of forgot about it until you saw it come up on Tubi. It's, it's definitely worth watching, so go check it out if you haven't seen it. If you have seen it, let me know what you thought about it in the comments. And that will do it for this Flickers of Fear. I will see you guys on the next one. Bye.